Hi, everyone. We're just going to wait a few minutes as people continue to log on and join the webinar. We'll just get started in one minute. All right, well, welcome to today's webinar, Wildlife Protections and Oil and Gas Rules, a new approach to ensuring wildlife protections in Colorado. Um, I'm Abby Kranz, I am WRA's Marketing Manager, um, and I'll be your Zoom host for today. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, just a few quick housekeeping items and reminders. Um, we are going to try to keep this webinar as close to 45 minutes as we can. Um, we'll be leaving 15 to 20 minutes at the end for some questions. Um, we won't be taking questions live, but in case you're new to the Zoom webinar platform, there should be a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, right in the middle. Um, if you click that, you are free to type any questions you have for our panelists throughout the presentation, um, and we'll take as many as we can at the end. We won't be able to get to everyone, but we promise to do our best to follow up afterwards um, in case we don't get to yours. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed to Facebook. Um, and if you registered today, um, or if you know someone who did and wasn't able to make it, uh, we'll be sending out the recording um, and any other resources that our pre uh, presenters share with all of you today um, within 48 hours of our presentation. Um, so with that, I will turn this over to uh, Jora Walker, who is our moderator for today and WRA's general counsel. Um, Joro works with our program directors to identify um, opportunities to use state and federal law to protect um, land, air, and water quality. She has also um, works especially with the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. And so with that, I'll invite Joro to turn her video on um, and let her take it from here. Thanks, Abby. So I'm just going to jump right in. In 2019, the Colorado General Assembly passed SB 181 and radically changed the way oil and gas development in the state would be regulated. So prior to 181, the COGCC, or I'll call it the commission, administered, and that's the agency that administers oil and gas in Colorado, was tasked with fostering oil and gas development. But because of SB 181, the commission now has the mission of managing oil and gas to protect and to avoid and minimize adverse impact to public health, safety, and welfare, the environment, wildlife, and biological resources, and air, water, and soil that result from oil and gas operations. So you can see that's a significant change. So SB 181 focuses in large part on safeguarding wildlife and ecosystem values. Thus, the new law is a response to the fact in part that oil and gas was having and could increasingly have a profound adverse effect on Colorado wildlife. SB 181, this new law, brought other critical changes to Colorado and the way it regulates oil and gas to protect wildlife. The new law directs the commission to evaluate and address cumulative impacts, including those on wildlife, and to create a new process for considering alternative locations for proposed oil and gas development. This matters to wildlife because wildlife is particularly vulnerable to cumulative impacts. These are incremental impacts that can, can combine to have significant adverse consequences, such as the destruction of and fragmentation of habitat. Also choices where oil and gas development is located, for example, away from wetlands or migration corridors can also have an acute impact on wildlife. So together, these changes to Colorado law promise to have um, a, to forward the safeguarding of wildlife and its habitat. But the law was just the beginning. And like a lot of legislation, it directed the commission to make rules to carry out the changes the new law requires. So during 2020, 
The commission, staff, and a lot of stakeholders and parties participated in a lengthy rulemaking process that resulted in an overhaul of the rules, including the rules that safeguard wildlife and the role, the rules that dictate how the public can play a role in decision making that impacts wildlife. So now is the time to start using these rules to safeguard wildlife uh, in the manner that the lawmakers intended. And this webinar is intended to provide insight into those new rules. First, we start with what is at stake as Colorado starts using its new rules to protect wildlife and the wildlife that Coloradans prize so highly, what the due process will look like and how members of the public can participate in that process to safeguard the wildlife that they cherish. So we start out with a pre presentation by Jessica Shusinski of the research that she gave to the commission during the rulemaking process. Jessica, and this, Jessica is especially qualified to analyze the landscape level impacts of oil and gas. She has spent the past 13 years focusing on improving wildlife conservation and outcomes by applying conservation science and spatial analysis to wildlife planning and management. Next, we have Commissioner Priya Nanjapa, and she will explain some of the ways in which the oil and gas rules protect wildlife and how the public can influence how the commission makes decisions impacting wildlife. Commissioner Nanjapa is the commission's expert on environmental protection, wildlife protection, and reclamation, and brings to the new job, significant expertise and credentials based on 20 years of work in wildlife conservation and environmental policy. We wrap up with a presentation from Taylor Elm, the Regional Energy Liaison for Colorado Parks and Wildlife's Northwest Region. Under the new COGCC or Commission rules, CPW can play a significant role in how oil and gas development is regulated. Based on more than a decade of working in the field, Taylor will explain how CPW will participate in the commission decision-making process and what the new 1200 series, the series that is dedicated to protecting wildlife means for wildlife. And so I turn it over to Jessica. Thanks, Doro. Um, hello to everybody and thank you for being here. My name is Jessica and today I'm going to talk about um, some research I did for WRA last year in which I mapped oil and gas development disturbance across Colorado to inform wildlife protection. Next. In recent decades, wildlife species and habitats have declined and degraded across Colorado. These declines are of great concern for wildlife management agencies, local governments, and the citizens of Colorado because these species and habitats hold such tremendous ecological, recreational, economic, and cultural value. To date, the overwhelming body of evidence suggests that land use change due to anthropogenic development has played the greatest role in species declines and habitat degradation. Next. Oil and gas development is an important driver of land use change in Colorado. Over the last 10 years, an average of over 1,900 new oil and gas wells have been drilled per year in the state. And there's growing evidence that oil and gas development has important impacts on species and habitats across Colorado, including things like habitat loss and fragmentation and increased mortality risk for species. Next. The COGCC mission change requires that the agency regulate oil and gas development in Colorado in a manner that protects species and habitats. To ensure species and habitats are adequately protected from oil and gas development impacts, wildlife management agencies, local governments, and the citizens of Colorado need data which represent the special, spatial and temporal patterns of oil and gas development across the state. These data are critical to identifying areas in Colorado which have been subject to chronic oil and gas development and may be heavily degraded. Next. The amount of land distributed by, uh, sorry, the amount of land disturbed by anthropogenic development is a widely accepted indicator of the impact of the development on species and habitats. And land disturbance can be quantified across large spatial, spatial and temporal scales relatively easily. So in the case of oil and gas development, significant disturbance due to oil and gas development in, indicates that oil and gas development impacts to species and habitats is also likely significant. Next. 
In order to identify areas which have been subject to chronic oil and gas development and may be heavily degraded, I quantified and mapped disturbance due to oil and gas across all Colorado in 2019. I quantified disturbance due to oil and gas development as the area of land directly disturbed by oil and gas development per game management unit. This measure of disturbance accounted for the long-term cumulative impact of abandoned and plugged oil wells, oil and gas wells. Game management units or GMUs are geographic areas which are delineated by CPU to represent meaningful geographies for Colorado's big game species. They can be used to evaluate impacts on a variety of species as they encompass the resources needed to support healthy populations of keystone species. Next. This map shows the area disturbed as a percent of the total area by oil and gas development per GMU in Colorado in 2019. The lighter reds represent less disturbance and the darker reds represent more disturbance. No or low disturbance, which are the two lightest reds uh, due to oil and gas development indicate that the impacts of oil and gas development on species and habitats in these GMUs are relatively low. However, keeping disturbance low in these areas in these GMUs is a priority because healthy intact wildlife resources provide critical support for Colorado's biodiversity on a statewide scale and restoring wildlife resources once they have become degraded can be expensive and time consuming. Any increase in disturbance due to oil and gas development in these GMUs in the future is cause for concern. Moderate high or very high disturbance, the three darker red categories, due to oil and gas development indicates that the impacts of oil and gas development on species and habitats in these GMUs are significant. Species and habitats in these GMUs require protection from oil and gas development at this time. It's clear that the intensity of disturbance due to oil and glass, gas development varies widely across the state, and that's something we would expect. We can see that the most intensely disturbed GMUs are concentrated in the northeast and northwest areas of the state. 81% of the GMUs, which are classified as highly, very highly disturbed or highly disturbed, I'm sorry, are classified as very highly disturbed, are located in these areas. And within these GMUs, a total of more than 189,000 acres have been directly disturbed by oil and gas operations. The impacts of oil and gas development on species and habitats in these areas of the state are likely significant due to this high concentration of very intense disturbance. Next. Oil and gas development has important impacts on species and habitats across Colorado and avoiding and minimizing the impacts of oil and gas development in areas of high disturbance is critical to restoring species and habitats and protecting them from further degradation. With this data on oil and gas development disturbance and the new oil and gas rules for wildlife protection, we have the tools to safeguard Colorado's diverse and valuable species and habitats. Let's make good use of these tools and ensure the protection of wildlife across Colorado. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Priya now. Thank you so much, Jessica. And uh, thanks to everybody who is attending today and to WRA for putting on this webinar. I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you all. Um, I also just wanna note that because this is a very short uh, time frame, that my email will be on the last slide and, uh, and um, just welcome anybody to contact me with additional questions. Um, also very happy that we have Taylor Elm uh, giving some additional details to the, the rules um, that I won't be able to cover in great depth and I'll focus a little bit more on the public engagement side of things. Uh, next slide, please. So just very quickly for those of you who are not familiar with the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, um, there are five full-time commissioners with particular ex expertise uh, that they bring to bear on, on COGCC decisions. And so I am one of those commissioners and uh, the others are listed there and you can see the different areas of expertise that uh, they were um, brought to the commission for. Um, we were all appointed in July of 2020, so just over a year now. Um, and this was in relation to uh, what was um, put forward in SB 19181, which I'll uh, touch on just a little bit in a moment. Um, next. There, we also have two ex officio non-voting members that uh, represent the DNR and the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment. 
The COGCC has about 140 staff members and we have a leadership team um, that you can see there listed by area. Um, for the purposes of, of this particular talk, um, questions may go primarily to Greg Duranlo uh, in our environmental team um, or per perhaps to Jane Stanzik um, who handles our permitting. Um, but definitely as it comes to meetings um, and hearings and et cetera, and, and some of the public engagement processes, um, you might also interact with, with Mimi Larson. Um, next. And so we have this directive here, I won't read it to you, but um, the primary uh, focus here is what changed with SB 19181, um, which is to protect and minimize adverse impacts to public health, safety and welfare, the environment and wildlife resources. Um, and then of course, uh, protecting against adverse impacts on air, water, soil, or biological resources. Um, so this is again, this is a new, um, a, a new change to our mission. Next slide. So as I just noted, and as, uh, as Joro also noted in her introduction, um, SB 19181 was passed in April of 2019. Uh, at that time, a volunteer commission was seated uh, temporarily at that point. Um, and then, as I noted in July of 2020, the, the full-time commission was appointed uh, and, uh, and began work um, in July. With that mission change related to that directive that I, on the previous slide, um, changing our mission from fostering oil and gas development to regulating oil and gas development, uh, and prioritizing public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources, we undertook a, a, a bunch of different rulemakings. Some of those rulemakings that were directed by SB 19181 took place in 2019 and into part of 2020. Um, and, and then we undertook a, a huge rulemaking in the fall in, um, for our mission change and several different rules were changed with that as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, as I go forward. Next slide, please. Oh, and just to note, uh, sorry, if you could go back. Uh, we do have a financial assurance rulemaking that is going to be starting. Uh, we've already had some opportunities for um, public input there, um, but there will be additional opportunities for, for input into our financial assurance. Um, this is to ensure that we have the funds available when uh, a site is closed after oil and gas development is completed. Next. So day-to-day -day operations um, with the mission change rulemaking that I noted, those rules were just implemented in January 15th of 2021. So a few months into this year, we started to receive applications um, for new locations and um, other aspects of operations that now are subject to the new rules. Um, but Rulemaking is a very uh, slow process and implementation thereof is a very slow process. So we actually have not even heard our first new surface location under the new rules, but we will be hearing that um, coming up sometime soon. So that relates to the siting um, aspect of oil and gas development with our form two A's or sometimes uh, also known as the oil and gas development plan or OGDP, you may hear me use that acronym. So that relates to the surface location. When that application comes in, it tells us where the location is, the number of wells um, that are being proposed. Uh, we do now have with the passage of SB 19181, co-equal authority with local government, uh, or sorry, with our rule, um, our rulemaking last fall. Now we have co-equal authority with local government. And what that means is that a new site cannot go forward unless we have a yes from the local government and a yes from COGCC. So it has to be uh, yeses from both parties before um, that location can move forward. There's also a process for coordination with federal government. Um, next. And we have to now with the new rules, we have to consider cumulative impacts, which are stated in rules 303 and 304 and impacts to wildlife resources. Um, in particular, when uh, we have um, a site that, is, that falls within high priority habitat, which I'll talk a little bit more about and, and Taylor will as well. Um, there must be a wildlife protection, uh, sorry, when you're outside of high priority habitat, you have to have a wildlife protection plan. When you're inside of wildlife, of high priority habitat, you must have a wildlife mitigation plan. And there's some additional factors that go into that. 
Um, along with that, with our Form 2s for min mineral development or our application for a uh, permit to drill, this is after a surface location has been approved. Um, for any new location going forward, we would be considering you know, all of these different aspects of, of the wildlife protections and, and other public health and, and safety and welfare protections. And there may be conditions of approval that are attached to that approval um, for existing locations that were previously approved before these rules were changed. Um, this is now, again, something that we would be looking at when a new form two comes in and to be able to determine um, whether or not there should be additional conditions of approval um, to be protective for both uh, public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife resources. Um, we also have teams that continue to do inspections, enforcement, remediation and reclamation and, and reviewing those processes, ensuring that uh, the operators are all um, keeping up with all of our rules related to um, these aspects. Next slide. So the 1200 series rules, um, you will see, I think a link um, in the chat to the full series of rules. Um, these are our wildlife rules in particular, but we do have other rule series and there are some relationships to them. So I'm just gonna quickly touch on those. In our 300 series, that this is what covers our permitting process. Um, and that is where the alternative location analysis is covered. Basically with an alternative location analysis, um, there's a whole bunch of different triggers that um, set forth that process. Um, and in particular, it has to do with protecting people, proximity to schools or uh, residential buildings. Um, and also a new um, aspect is, is uh, disproportionately impacted communities, which we have defined in our rules. And when a location occurs within um, or within 2,000 feet of a disproportionately impacted community, um, there's additional uh, information that needs to be put forward into the application um, and uh, has to be part of the alternative location analysis in, in terms of considering um, these impacts to people. Um, the rest of the bullets here are the aspects that, uh, the subset of aspects that relate to environmental or wildlife factors. So um, you can see them there. And uh, uh, Taylor will be touching a little bit more on some of these aspects um, in his slides. Next, please. So some of the key concepts in our wildlife rules are, are basically the mitigation hierarchy. First, we wanna avoid um, impacts and our high priority habitat designation really is the primary way we do that. Uh, then we want to minimize impacts. So things like our wildlife protection plans um, for those areas outside of wildlife habitat. Um, and in some cases within uh, high priority habitat, um, there will be uh, some aspects of mitigation um, when there, uh, the avoidance is not possible. Um, we also have landscape level, level planning that is now uh, part of our new rule series. So I, I mentioned already about the wildlife protection plans and mitigation plans. Um, we also have a comprehensive area plan process um, where operators can propose a larger area that they may be um, looking at for development, but as part of that, they have to propose the area, they have to address all the cumulative impacts, they have to look at the proximity to, um, to people in schools and residential buildings, et cetera. Um, they have to look at the wildlife impacts. And so this is another way that we can get a little bit better at landscape level planning and um, help to um, look at things more comprehensively. Next slide. Uh, some other key concepts are that we are really um, emphasizing early consultation with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, and you'll hear more about that from Taylor. Um, there may be, there, there are opportunities as well for CPW to request consultation. Um, there are notices that will go out to um, communities that are nearby the oil and gas uh, location. And uh, there are certain parties that will always get notified and CPW is one of them. CDPHE is the, another, another and there are several others that are included in that list. Um, and then our high priority habitat, as I mentioned before, uh, these are covered specifically in rule 1202C and D. Uh, if you look at the full rule set, um, this is now kind of what is a substitution for what was in our prior rule set for restricted surface occupancy and uh, for sensitive wildlife habitat. And our high priority habitat is now uh, considered no surface occupancy. And again, you'll hear more about this from Taylor. Next slide. 
So there are several opportunities to provide comment. Um, we have weekly public hearings. In fact, there's one this evening on the third Wednesday of every month, we do an evening hearing to better accommodate folks who are working. Um, so that is begins tonight at 6 p.m. for anybody who wants to turn in and the information is available on the COGCC homepage. Um, otherwise, they occur at uh, 9 a.m. typically, but during the summer we have pushed to 9.30 just because of uh, various family obligations and summer camp schedules, et cetera. Um, but there's always an opportunity to sign up for public comment there. There's an opportunity to comment on pending form two A's or, or OGDPs. Those were the surface locations, as I mentioned before. So that's the first thing that, that we um, get when there's a new location being proposed. And there's a guide, a PDF guide that will be, uh, I believe circulated to the participants or posted on the website later on that you'll be able to see um, that walks you through that process and that has some screenshots of where on the COGCC website you can find uh, the different uh, places to, to find those pending applications and to find um, how you can uh, submit your, your comments. Um, there's also a complaint process on our website. And so once a surface location has already been approved and or drilling activity has begun, um, there are there's a process for registering complaints or for registering um, information related to wildlife concerns uh, that you may have. And that goes through our process. It, um, prompts an investigation from our staff and then determine and, and a determination of whether or not there has been a violation of the rules. Um, and especially in the case of wildlife, then of course CPW would be uh, brought into that process as well. Next slide. So additional upcoming tasks um, are that we have a biological resources working group that I will be leading. We've identified several parties that are going to be involved in a core group and then there'll be a larger group that will also be participating um, what we're going to be considering are, are different terms, including uh, what we mean by biological resources and um, identifying data sources. So uh, this came up in, in particular because um, wildlife are well covered by CPW um, and with their authority that is granted to them um, uh, through the state. Um, but for plants and for uh, invertebrates, the authority is less clear. And so this will help us to better identify data sources so that we can better um, protect those resources as well and to, um, and to protect them um, going forward. Next. Um, we are to issue our recommendations by January 15th of 2022 and those will be made public at that time. Next. We also have a riparian, riparian areas technical working group. This is really just primarily a staff level um, exercise with CPW and COGCC staff. Uh, again, looking at data sources and mapping and looking at um, the best way to uh, provide that information so that um, those areas can be uh, best protected. Next. And so with that, I just wanted to quickly make some acknowledgements. These were the folks, especially from CPW that were involved and the COGCC staff on the uh, right corner and then uh, Advance once more, please. And I just wanna thank all the stakeholders that provided comment during the rulemaking. Uh, Jessica was uh, one of the experts that provided um, data and information that really helped us with our decision-making in the rulemaking process. So thanks to all of, of the people that participated there. And uh, with that, I will pass it along to Taylor who will give you a little bit more information about the, the rules themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Nanjapa, and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, I will jump in and speak for a little bit to the 1200 series rules and specific wildlife protections, and then also the uh, CPW consultation process. Uh, just real quick, wanted to make note that CPW is the state wildlife agency that's responsible um, for managing just over 900 species of fish and other wildlife in the state of Colorado. Next. Uh, one of our, our, toolbox, our tools in our toolbox for managing wildlife in Colorado is getting involved in land use uh, decision-making processes by regulatory agencies. And um, by regulatory agencies, I mean a whole handful from our federal partners uh, at BLM and, and United States Forest Service to other state agencies such as State Land Board and COGCC to even local counties and, and local municipalities. Uh, the steps that we, we typically take to engage in this land use process um, are first to assess the potential impacts to wildlife and habitat from a proposed development. 
Based on that assessment, we then make recommendations. Uh, these are typically measures to avoid, minimize, and mitigate, as you've heard mentioned already. And then lastly, oftentimes we help those regulatory agencies by coordinating on the implementation of our recommendations. Um, those might be the application of best management practices or implementing um, compensatory mitigation measures. Next. Here's just a quick map that shows um, myself and some of my counterparts on our energy and land use team and where we're distributed across the state. You will see uh, when you receive a copy of these slides, there's a few links embedded in mine. Um, there's a link on this slide that provides a little bit more detailed contact information for all of us. I would encourage you to reach out if you have any questions or needs to, to contact us, feel free to reach out to anybody. Next. All right, so diving into the 1200 series or the wildlife regulations, uh, I've highlighted four bullet points and I'll mention a few others um, on this slide. And these are kind of four from a CPW perspective that were pretty key changes to give us um, some additional tools to, to help um, protect wildlife during oil and gas development. The first one here is expanded no surface occupancy areas or NSO. And I've noted too that, um, you know, came up quite a bit during the rulemaking process. The first one is LEC buffer distances. Uh, these are areas surrounding the LEC sites for greater and Gunnison sage grouse and lesser prairie chickens, which were expanded. The second one is aquatic setbacks. And these are the buffer distances around certain CPW designated uh, stream and river segments, as well as some lakes. Uh, second is additional high priority habitat areas, which you've heard uh, mentioned quite a few times here. And uh, now currently in the rules, there are 50 HPH layers. In the previous rules, there was 29. And I wanted to make a note that um, that includes many more than just 50 individual wildlife species, particularly our aquatic designated uh, habitats. Some of those include numerous fish species, as well as um, some amphibians and some other aquatic based organisms. Uh, third here, there was incorporated a, uh, a much more robust set of statewide operating requirements. These are, are protections for wildlife and for wildlife habitats that apply regardless if a new location is within high priority habitats or not. And then last on this slide uh, is this idea of mandatory compensatory mitigation to offset both direct and indirect impacts. In the past, uh, CPW has worked with operators and industry um, to implement compensatory mitigation on a voluntary basis. And so in the new rules, at least within a certain subset of HPH, which I'll touch on uh, here in a second, um, there are requirements for compensatory mitigation. And outside of these four bullet points, I did want to note just real quick, run through an, uh, a few other things that some of which you've already heard touched on. Um, an alternative location analysis for locations in high priority habitat, better tracking of cumulative impacts to wildlife, uh, the requirement for wildlife mitigation plans in high priority habitat, uh, annual habitat mapping updates, uh, which is key. So we're, we're always uh, operating under the most current set of maps and, and wildlife data. And then also a more robust waiver and variance process has been incorporated uh, for operator requests to waivers and variances to any portion of um, the 1200 series rules or, or really any uh, rule requirement. Uh, next. All right, so you've heard this term high priority habitat thrown around quite a bit today, but I, I did wanna real quick just explain um, what a high priority habitat is when it comes to CPW's considerations. And typically, uh, these are areas necessary for a particular species to survive and reproduce in order for CPW to maintain the persistence of those species within Colorado. To be designated as a high priority habitat, CPW needs two things. Uh, the first being, we need good geospatial data uh, to be able to delineate that habitat and say where it exists on the landscape. The second is we need some sound science-based recommendations to avoid, minimize, and mitigate impacts to the species or habitat. So we need to be able to tell those, uh, those regulatory agencies what can be done within those habitats, or if they should just be avoided altogether. 
Um, I've placed three examples. Like I mentioned, there's 50 layers in the high priority habitat uh, document. So here's three just to help you wrap your head around what some of these um, kind of look like. And then I've placed another link uh, to that HPH document on our website. Next. And speaking of that link, um, this is the first page of that high priority habitat or HPH document. I included this just to call out a couple things. Uh, on the left side, you'll see a column with the name of the HPH layers. Many of these are blue indicating a hyperlink where you can access the GIS data from our public uh, GIS site. Uh, for those of you wanting to take a deeper dive. And then in the right column of this document, you will see the associated uh, CPW recommendations to avoid, minimize, and mitigate for each particular HPH layer. And then just a, a quick shout out to COGCC's online mapping tool as well. It is a fantastic resource. It includes all of this data uh, and much, much more for those looking to do a deeper dive. Next slide. Uh, so with, within the 1200 series, the high priority habitat layers um, were essentially broken into three categories. This first one um, are kind of the most sensitive habitats where we, we really can't reproduce these habitats through mitigation or any other means. And you'll see the list here, I won't read through them, but you will see highlighted in blue there are the four specific aquatic designations that I had mentioned. Uh, the next one is uh, this category where the literature tells us um, that the key to developing within these habitats is lower density of oil and gas locations. And also um, CPW feels we can conduct effective compensatory mitigation to offset uh, impacts to a certain degree within this set of habitats. And then the last is all of the remaining HPH layers, which essentially trigger a CPW consultation, but not necessarily the two uh, restrictions as the, the two previous categories. All right, just to, to touch on the CPW consultation process, um, a bulk of our consultations occur from new locations within HPH. There are some other triggers in the rule, but this is kind of the primary one for us. And I also wanted to note that CPW staff does receive a notification of all new proposed oil and gas developments. This provides us an opportunity to do a red flag review even outside of HPH and determine if there's um, a need for a consultation based on something that maybe we don't have mapped out there. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, continuing on the process of a CPW consultation, uh, we CPW staff received 60 days from the notice from COGCC that there is a new permit submitted to complete our formal consultation. Um, during this time, we work with the operator, we work with COGCC staff, we work with the landowners, and local governments um, to complete our consultation and come up with our wildlife recommendations. So the steps of our consultation um, typically include kind of these, these four categories. This first one is not a requirement of operators, but as you, as you heard earlier, it is strongly encouraged by COGCC and CPW for operators to do this early communication. There's a lot of efficiencies in having these uh, conversations early on before an operator has committed resources to surveying and developing all the planning documents for a location. And so it's something that uh, can be really effective um, and we encourage that, that early communication. Second is the concept of an alternative location analysis so that we can explore potentially less impactful locations. Uh, third is working with the operator to develop best management practices to further reduce impacts. And then finally, uh, where it's applicable and in the habitats where um, it's required by rule is working with the operators to develop compensatory mitigation to offset those remaining uh, residual adverse impacts. We communicate with COGCC staff in a number of ways throughout the process from the onsite in person to follow up communications to eventually our formal um, comments and approval of a permit through the digital e-form system. And just another note that at the end of the day, our uh, comments are recommendations to the regulatory agency, which is COGCC, and it is up to COGCC commissioners and director to decide whether to implement those uh, recommendations as conditions of approval on the permit. Next. So uh, COGCC has some ongoing tasks as well. Uh, two that I've highlighted specifically here 
the first is our compensatory mitigation program. Specifically, we're working on a tracking database for reporting and tracking of uh, mitigation projects completed, both by operators and by CPW. And then also we're working internally on a planning and prioritization process within oil and gas basins so we can better um, identify needs and have shovel ready projects kind of ready to go for compensatory mitigation. And then second, uh, we're working to further refine our mapping of migration corridors and pinch points for big game. And I placed a, a photo here of a highway crossing structure on highway nine. Um, these are areas that that we're considering pinch points. These are some obvious ones where there's high fencing along a highway with a crossing structure and obviously um, important to protect these areas to maintain the effectiveness of things like this. And next slide. And yeah, a huge thanks from CPW staff, especially to all the COGCC staff that we worked on through this process um, and really all of the stakeholders that were involved during the 1200 series rulemaking. Um, it was a really cool process for, for me to be involved in. And I know that CPW is really proud of the end result and the protections that it provides for Colorado's wildlife. And that's all I have. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you panelists. Um, that was a terrific introduction to uh, the process, the risks, and the way that the public might be involved in protecting wildlife. So here's our first question. And I'm not sure exactly uh, who should answer it. So hopefully you'll decide amongst yourselves. What are some of the strategies for increasing public engagement across regions? Anyone? I'll, I'll try and take a stab at that, uh, Joro, thanks. I, I think, um, you know, we are really thinking about that as commissioners at COGCC of, of how we can, um, you know, better engage, uh, especially with impacted communities. Um, and so, you know, one way that we're talking about doing that is to start uh, now that, um, certain COVID protocols are, are getting a little bit clearer in, in terms of travel that we may be traveling to other parts of the state um, and trying to meet directly with, with communities or have some of our hearings in um, local areas. Um, we are also planning to continue a hybrid version of our um, weekly hearings. They used to be in person you know, entirely up until COVID um, and then they were entirely virtual. And now I think uh, there will be some sort of hybrid version that will be offered so people can always participate virtually, which, which hopefully will allow folks from anywhere in the state to participate at any time. Um, I'm not sure if that gets at the question, but hopefully that helps. Okay, thank you. Here's, here's another one. Uh, how does CPW, this one's for you, Taylor. How does CPW collaborate with private landowners in highly disturbed areas? Good question. Um, you know, really, I mentioned the pre-consultation process, but um, even once our formal consultation starts, we typically always conduct an on-site review of a location. And I mentioned we, we always work with landowners and typically uh, a private landowner is, is at the on-site um, and involved in those discussions. So I would say that is the, the primary way that, that we're in communication with the landowner. They can provide their input um, important to note too that you know CPW always wants to defer to a landowner's um, desires for their their individual property. Um, if there are ways that that we can do things to mitigate impacts offsite off of their property, we may pursue that. But that would be the primary mechanism where we engage with the landowner and um, you know get them involved in the discussion. Uh, another one from the Q and A. Uh, this one's probably for Commissioner Nanjapa. Can a permit be denied in order to protect wildlife and biological resources? You know, that's a really great question. We do have the authority now with the passage of SB 19181 to be able to deny permits, um, but it would really have to be a, um, a holistic approach to kind of looking at all of the different 
um, matters that you know we're responsible for um, attending to uh, public health, safety, welfare, um, the environment, and wildlife resources. And so, depending on um, you know again with our sort of mit mitigation hierarchy, you know if we can avoid impacts to any of those, um, we'll do that. If we can minimize impacts in, in some ways or to some of those, um, you know, then there may be some considerations or conditions of approval that, that may come into play. Um, and, you know, if, if there's just an instance where it just doesn't seem like we can um, avoid, minimize or mitigate appropriately, um, or just the location is just, you know, um, much too close to um, a, a sensitive resource or to a school or to a, et cetera, um, you know, that, that may be um, grounds for, for considering um, not approving the permit. Um, I will also say that the staff at COGCC is often in communication with the operators quite a bit. And if they see an application that comes in that is um, just really, you know, not likely to fly, they'll probably just tell them, you know, try again. And so um, there's a lot of conversation that happens um, in that way as well, but um, certainly we do have the authority now and it would it would depend on on a lot of different factors and sort of considering whether or not um, We could implement uh, adequate protections Okay, thank you and for Taylor does CPW consult on Colorado threatened and endangered species as well as federal listed species so um, we, we do if it is a, a species incorporated into the high priority habitat table. And so uh, from my presentation, if you recall, if it is something that we do have spatial data and mapping for um, that can trigger that consultation, and it is something that we do have recommendations for, then we do. Um, I, I will clarify, I guess, on the, the federal species that in the rules, it does trigger a CPW consultation. Um, although oftentimes that involves us just ensuring that the operator has taken the, the necessary steps to have the appropriate uh, consultation for the t and &E species with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so there, there can be another layer um, there with another agency, depending on um, a federal designation, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. And then... Uh, so how does how does a member of the public figure out if a proposed oil and gas development project is going to impact, you know, an area they care about or a herd that they care about? I'll, I'll start with that and maybe Taylor can jump in as well um, with. So the guide that you will be uh, receiving or I think will be posted. Um, I'm not sure if we can do a quick screen share on that, but um, it will, it, it kind of walks you through the process. So there's a dashboard on the COGCC homepage where you can look at pending um, applications and there's a, a map that's associated with that as well. So you can sort of determine where those locations are. Um, you can filter by a few different factors, um, you know, like by county or by um, a couple of other uh, different um, factors and then if it's available for public comment, then you can submit your comment. Um, you can see the guide, they're just being paged through here, but um, hopefully with all the screen captures and the little arrows to, to help you see sort of where you put things in um, or where you can find information, uh, you'll be able to see that. If you are in an area that is within, um, uh, within uh, like if your home is within 2000 feet of a proposed location um, or, there's a few other factors that may come into play that you might end up getting noticed as part of just the typical notice process. Um, then you may, um, you know, you'll have an opportunity within the notice, uh, there'll be a link that you can submit your, your comments or um, you can submit a petition if there's a concern. Um, and if you, you know, with the, the surface, a new surface location, that's really one of the best opportunities because we have, you know, we have a hearing and and there's an opportunity to, to you know, register for public comment um, or to provide your public comment on the the application itself. Um, once the location is already approved um, and there are operations that are beginning, if you are kind of watching that location and maybe have a wildlife related concern, you can go through our complaints process 
um, even before operations have begun, and that will allow uh, the COGCC staff to initiate an investigation or to engage CPW if needed, um, and you know to be able to check out and see you know what's going on and whether there's any way to um, uh, to avoid impacts or or minimize or mitigate. Um, Taylor, anything you want to add on that? Just from a, a wildlife perspective, um, and I think that's a fantastic tool that COGCC has developed there to, to help outline some of the steps and opportunities. And then um, once uh, you know the location has been ascertained or you, you kind of know what location you're looking at, those resources that I linked to uh, as far as some of our high priority habitat layers and that COGCC mapping tool, I think are, are very valuable. Um, our layers are under the Colorado Parks and Wildlife folder on COGCC's tool. And you can click through and, and really get a feel uh, from a biological perspective of wh what we have mapped in the area and what might be kind of higher concern um, for members of the public kind of wanting to take a look and, and dive into it a little deeper. Great, that's, that's very helpful. And then uh, a couple more maybe. Uh, so the high priority habitat maps, are they updated? And if so, how does the public uh, get involved in that process? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so some of the layers on in, in the high priority habitat table are updated on different schedules. Uh, a lot of them um, occur on a, a rotating basis between our four regions in the state. And so each region gets updated once every four years. These are some of the big game habitats like severe winter ranges, um, production areas, migration corridors, those types of things. Um, other layers like raptor nests and sage grouse selects, those actually get updated annually statewide. Um, so I, I did mention too, another, another key aspect in the 1200 series, well, not necessarily spelled out in the rules, but um, an anticipated uh, path is what we're gonna do at COGCC is update the uh, HBH table that's incorporated by the 1200 series rules every year. And so we will be operating on new data um, every year and the public um, can update or can check uh, the updated map layers through the HBH table that I mentioned. We keep all of our um, updates uh, in real time when we make them on our public GIS page. And so I, I guess the main answer to the question is yes, they are update, updated regularly. And the intent is to incorporate those updates annually into the uh, 1200 series rules. So, so Taylor, just a clarification, can the public sort of participate in the updates? So uh, they can, the, the updates into the 1200 series rules, it does require a commission hearing to update those map layers. It does require a rulemaking and therefore there will be a public participation component um, of that uh, hearing process. And Commissioner Najaba could speak to that a little bit more, but there will be a, a public participation process at that time. Yeah, so I, I believe that um, when those that that process of updating the the high priority habitat um, maps will come through um, I believe that actually will be be considered part of a, a rulemaking process to adopt the new high priority habitat maps um, and part of the reason for that is because we need to have sort of a frame of reference for what is considered high priority habitat so even though CPW may be making adjustments along the way throughout the year um, or over the course of you know, receiving new information, um, we have to sort of stick with one set of maps um, for a period of time until we you know, officially update them. So because it will be a rulemaking process, there will always be um, ample opportunity for public comment. Um, and again, if there are concerns or, or other things that need to be raised, um, our weekly hearings are another opportunity um, to engage uh, with, with any concerns um, related to high priority habitat and then as those maps and that rulemaking process goes forward, if there's um, new information that people have, they can submit it at that time. Okay, and here's another great question. Does deactivation or reclamation of drilling sites factor into the impact density analysis or the minimize mitigate priorities? Does that make sense? I'm not sure I'm understanding 
the, I mean, I understand that we're talking about, um, maybe if I'm, if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, it is the question that um, if a site has been fully reclaimed, um, would it be counted as a location in the, within the area? Um, is that, if that's the question, I, I think if it was fully reclaimed and had been approved and, and you know, that's a, it's a multi-year process for, the, um, for approving a, a reclamation of a site, um, I don't think it would be included at that point, but if it was in the process of reclamation and not yet fully completed, um, then it would be, I think, still considered an active location. Um, I'm not sure, Taylor, if you know any more about that, but um, I'll, I'll admit a little bit of ignorance to this just because we're, it's, it's so new and we're just in that early phase of implementation, but I believe that, that that's the way that would be considered. And uh, if I didn't get that right, um, the person who asked the question, if they wanna clarify, be happy to take another stab. No, they're, they're saying that you got the question right um, and understood it correctly. Uh, so Taylor, did you have anything to add? Not much, just um, where, where it kind of comes into play for CPW is when we're analyzing a, a new proposed location and we're kind of looking at existing disturbance around that area um, and, and specifically the density of development within a given area, um, we really want to be basing that on active locations. And so I guess I would just say if a location truly has been decommissioned, fully reclaimed, uh, is not receiving traffic or activity anymore, from a wildlife perspective, we would not be treating that as an active location um, in those considerations. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so I think that kind of draws to a close the uh, question and answer section of the webinar. Awesome. Well, I'll just end by uh, once again thanking all of our panelists for joining us today and our own Dora Walker for moderating. Um, and just a reminder for um, all of our attendees to uh, watch your inboxes for a follow-up email uh, from WRA that will include a recording of this session, um, a slide deck of the PowerPoint presentation that you saw, um, and we'll pull out all of the links um, and contact information um, as appropriate as the panelists presented them today. So once again, thank you. Um, and that's it. Enjoy the rest of your afternoons. <laughs>